So how many people here have a LinkedIn profile up? Most of you. That's all self-reported, right? Yes. So none of the data about where we got our education is actually verified. Not yet. I think that's sort of interesting that right now our sort of personal portfolios are out there and the flow of data coming from the university side of the house that can really give people as you guys saw in the visualization earlier, more depth about what people's education is, is not set free from that system yet, and not able to plug into these kinds of systems. Um, and the same thing is true about um, the dollars that a student has available to them to take courses is not flowing into Mint. It's not as if you can look at your portfolio of dollars and say, I've got this much to spend on my education, here's how I want to use it. You might know how many loans you have to repay, but you don't actually know what your bank balance is for your for your educational budget for planning forward. And I think that that those are two areas that if we look at changing some of the ecosystem, that the the, the spaces that these guys have been participating and creating are really critical to that. With that, I want to make sure we open this dialogue Let me just to questions. Too. One one thing yeah. and then then questions great. So we've given a lot of thought and we actually already have a back-end thing designed that we will productize about, oh, so I want to become a, you know, um, an owner of a coffee shop or a vice president of marketing or whatever. Here's what the paths look like and how to, in terms of how to go and, and make that happen. One of the things that I've been iterating on is thinking about how would I get the right data set to back that up into an educational system to say, well, these kinds of classes and these sorts of things would do that. We don't have any of that right now, um, but I've been thinking about that. Because the the whole data iteration for these path the, the pathing is actually really useful. I'm very excited to hear about that last piece. But um, the other thing I wanted to ask is, are you guys considering doing anything in which you're adding internships? Um, I know that people post jobs all the time on there, but we think that the companies could be posting internships for students. Uh, yes, actually, one of the things that we started working on last year, which will hit mostly this year, uh, and this was kind of this is more kind of founders' prerogative as we figured out what percentage of college grads were not getting jobs, and we're like, okay, we should be able to help with this some in terms of uh, informational interviewing, internships, et cetera. And it's not really, the internships piece um, is part of a broader, like how do you help college students find their way to on a diverse network basis to different, different kinds of economic opportunities. I don't know if we'll do anything more than allow internships to be kind of free or very cheap job listing postings as a way of finding it. But that sort of thing is is one of the things that we we started working on last summer, and hopefully by you know April, um, May or so for the next thing will be live. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm finding the uh, exchange so far today very exciting and also uh, sort of increasingly frustrating. The the exciting part is. Um, uh, uh, one part of the uh, the excitement for me is that in light of this last exchange, um, uh, I'm I'm sensing yet again that uh, learning across uh, sort of all levels of development is becoming more like the work of of scholars and and faculty, and that is we are a, an, a highly networked, highly informal, uh, uh, organize as you go, negotiate as you go kind of enterprise. That's what knowledge production is like. School isn't like that, but one of the hardest things to get students to understand is that to be a scholar is to actually produce knowledge is a very different enterprise than doing well um, well in a class. And I think um, uh, the, the the revolution that we're standing in the middle of today is sort of moving um, much of educational development in the direction of, of of knowledge production, which I think is really exciting. The uh, the 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 sobering part. Um, which I hope we talk about very soon, is that um, there are enormous uh, political implications to figuring out this, quote, infrastructure, unquote, that we're all waiting to, to liberate uh, uh, students and educators. I mean, we have the, 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 the lack of, of, of or formal structure in U.S. higher education is enormously freeing. Historically, it's made um, the sector some of the most entrepreneurial and innovative and flexible in world history. Uh, and so I think we should be really careful 
um, on the, first of all, to, to see uh, the, the organizational system of U.S. higher education as constraining. It's been it, it remarkably fecund and fertile. It's created much more variety than in any other system. Um, and when we're talking about uh, a new infrastructure that may, that from which we might take models from Mint or LinkedIn, um, that's a, a very large question. Who will control that infrastructure? Who will pay for it? Who will profit from it? Um, who will negotiate the terms of access to it? Um, and so it seems to me that's, that's really not a technological problem at this point in history. It's, it's, it's really a very large political problem um, that we need to address squarely and soon, I think. So I, I, I think that um, I, those are excellent points. Part of the reason that one of the breakouts is on policy in particular is, be, is literally because of this issue. Our dialogue so far with Lumina has been um, how do we create openness so that there's no one owner to it, that, that people are taking, releasing the data in a different way and really have a different relationship to it. It does have privacy and security implications, which we all know about, but the, the policy group um, and the platform groups in particular, I think, need to start to take that up. And in tomorrow's sessions, uh, we're going to talk about some of those things uh, squarely. I have to say I don't share as many of your concerns around the control and profit issues because in a networked world and where the cost of setting up and maintaining a site is so low and the potential revenue models uh, to to generate revenue off those, those sites are, are there's so many revenue models to be chosen from. You know, I'm a, a great fan of, of putting it out there and as quickly as you can and then letting the internet take it over and evolve it. And, you know, I look at Wikipedia, I look at Craigslist, I look at, you know, Twitter or Facebook. There's so much of a dynamic between the customers and the producers of a website that turns out to be for good and not for evil. I'm, I'm much more optimistic that if we just got something out there, it would find its natural level and the internet would require it to be objective and open and unbiased because it doesn't, you don't survive otherwise. Uh, I'm not, uh, let's see, I'm optimistic about many things. I do think you need to intervene enough to have the right design of the ecosystem be the right thing. And one of the things that's interesting is where the social patterns and the technology actually have kind of blur into each other, right? Because I do think there are certain technology decisions in terms of kind of APIs, um, uh, you know, Tim's here talking about you know openness of data, not lock-in of data, and that sort of thing, which is really key. The one thing I think is, as long as you actually have kind of the internet itself being an open platform, it allows networks to form and compete with each other very easily. And so, doing it from a bottoms-up, build a thing, have it go, rather than a top-down decision-making process, is almost always a better strategy. And I think, I think part of what we're starting to see in the political struggle, and we're, I'm already hearing about it in some of the conversations here, is people thinking if they own certain words, then they can contain the activity. <laughs> like owning the word university, or owning uh, you know, the word transcript, or owning something else. But the reality is, in every sector that we've seen this transition go through, uh, Really, if the individual owns the information about themselves and they're willing to share it in these kinds of environments, nobody thought people would put their, their bank passwords online to a third party for profits. Nobody thought that was true. Like, it was not possible. Nobody thought they would put their entire personal history uh, on the internet. And here, every one of you um, has done it. So, so I think that, that some of it is really, we have to, we have to say, how, how easily can we make it for people to do that? Because that's what they want to do. Yeah, we passed a, forgive me, tipping point a couple of years back where it's particularly among the age group that you'd be targeting for this, this portal or platform should you do it. Um, the, the desire for convenience and access so outweighs concerns of personal privacy and security that, you know, as you've all seen, there's almost nothing that people won't post on the web. To, to follow up, though, my, my concern with the platform, my optimism about the platform, what I would really encourage the people in the audience that are going to move, move forward with this to do is get it out there, even if it's ugly to start with, even if it's incomplete to start with, and then let it grow online. I mean, it was a couple of years before Facebook had APIs. It doesn't even have an API yet, truly. So, you know, you, it's great to have that roadmap to what your vision of 
what ultimately a, a user-generated tool could be, but better to get it out ugly in 2010. It'll be so much better by 2012, as opposed to wait two years to get it out there, because frankly, by that point, you'd probably miss, miss yeah. the opportunity. That's right. And, and one very quick point about data privacy. Um, one is, not just our, the whole framework of people's comfort changing, e.g. putting cell phones on numbers, on your public profile, on Facebook, and so forth. But also, it's actually always been the case that people with even a mild incentive are pretty open. And so, for example, there have been these sweepstakes businesses running for decades that are put in, you know, home address, phone number, social security number, et cetera, so you can win this car. And they take that and they sell it to everybody, <laughs> right, as an instance. It's literally just kind of an incentive. Uh, it's really the incentive structure that matters on that. So, Princess, you had a comment? Um, yeah. Big profile of users with an eye to maybe underserved uh, markets or market opportunities, like in the sense that, I mean, I, I, I'd imagine there's a certain professional educational level of experience that, I mean, will get this. And I don't know what that percentage is, but there might be a huge majority that just sort of may not get it. And I was wondering if you could comment on it and, and, and feel free to get beyond like the oversimplified like race, gender. I mean, there's probably something else I think going on underneath that. Um, but maybe even a particular comment on local geographies. Like, do you have the data to sort of look at the local geogra geographies of your users so that is there an urban rural issue in this or certain parts of the country, United States? I'll start from a LinkedIn. Um, so our demographics more or less mirror the broadband maps, right? So uh, in terms of like density of location and geographic area. Uh, actually, in fact, what may be surprising is that uh, all the way through, even though we've been seeing more of a pickup of college students adopting LinkedIn, uh, there are uh, heavy, our average age on LinkedIn is 41, right? And so it's always been, uh, from the initial set, is a, is a massive early adoption from mid-flight professionals in terms of, you know, kind of people who are directors or VPs at corporations or have at least five to seven years of experience. Cause Part of it is that most college students don't actually recognize what a network can do and how a professional network around them has anything to do with their career. Because they think, oh, it's like Facebook. And you know, my buddy John or my buddy Sarah, what can they do to help me with this stuff? They don't know anything more than I do. And so they don't, they don't, they don't get that there's transitivity and a way that you get collective intelligence from a network and all the rest of that. Because none of that con conceptual structure is part of the repertoire coming in. So it, it isn't actually particularly a, you know, elite versus um, you know, even working class or whatever, it's actually just like most 21-year-olds don't know. And it's beginning to change, I think, primarily as a function of we have so many people in, and it's like, well, shoot, I need to do something. People tell me to do something on my job thing. I should play with this thing LinkedIn. I think that's what's happening now. And our average demographic is, as you might imagine, um, average age of 29, so half 20-somethings, half 30-somethings. Uh, it was initially very largely uh, tech savvy and male, uh, about 70% uh, male, 30% female. That's shifted dramatically over the last two years, which is something I'm incredibly proud of. We're the only personal finance service ever launched um, that now has almost a 50-50 a split between male and female users. Um, and I think there are a lot of good reasons for that that, that I can speak to, but 50-50 male. The shopping video. Well. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was it. Girls going wild shopping, yeah. Um, interestingly enough, we also map to the, the broadband pattern of, of the U.S., um, but I have seen through some um, overlay data that, that we looked at uh, that we have about 5% um, farm workers or people that would identify themselves as living in, like, very farm, belt, rural, rural areas. Um, and I credit, you know, we're a great tool for managing your money, you know, difficult to make ends meet in a very cyclical, you know, agricultural um, business and, and managing a farm, one of the toughest jobs you could have. Um, so they, they're finding our tool as well, hopefully finding it as well. So one last question, and I've got the 30 second hook. So. Okay, uh, so I'll try to make this fast. It's probably gonna be a little incoherent. Uh, I'm Ken Himmelman, I'm the Dean of Admissions at Bennington College. So I stand uh, at the nexus of the college to, to high school to college transition. And so I watch kids coming, now, albeit it's a very small sample size, but um, nevertheless, you know, I go to conferences and I talk to people and it's unbelievable how 
uh, little thinking, how little good thinking there actually is about what kids are looking for. I mean, you stand at these college fair tables and it's terrifying what you're doing, really. Um, you know, do you have communications? No. Okay, goodbye. You know, and they don't even know what they're talking about. So, anyway, so that's, that's one piece of this is that when I think about systems and how you try to ch make change, one of the questions is how do you leverage things that, that go on naturally? Because if you try to impose something from the outside, it often doesn't, it's harder to make it work. But you've got millions of kids coming through this system on a regular basis. So it's just something for us to think about because I've often thought, boy, there's a lot of room for improvement in the educational part of this. But to come to what Reed was saying, which is what really got me thinking, um, he was talking about kind of the skill set and how do we create the pedagogies and how do we really teach these things. And because I, I work at Bennington, and be, I, before I came to Bennington, I worked in the nonprofit sector. So I worked in um, underserved neighborhoods in four different cities around the country, and I was working with kids who are, you know, first generation, work, they, they're going to terrible high schools, but we were creating really effective learning environments for them out of school. And a lot of the same principles are happening at Bennington as were happening in that nonprofit organization. And there are a lot about these kinds of collaborations and about problem solving and about um, developing a certain kind of skill set. I think they dovetail with what Liz was saying earlier about a true kind of problem-based liberal arts education is that, in fact, what the market needs right now is very much what that kind of education can deliver. And I, as I've thought about this problem, because I, I talk with guidance counselors a lot about, you know, what kinds of colleges should your kids look at and so forth, and it's, it's very hard because every college has everything in, at some level, so it's like, how do you really distinguish it's which one is closer to a Starbucks or which one is, you know, uh, on the East Coast or whatever? And I actually think one of the things I'd like to throw out there for us to think about is there are great pockets of things going on all over the country where there are really effective learning environments. I happen to think Bennington is one of them, but there are many, many others in all different kinds of institutions. So one way to try to leverage the system a little bit, I've often thought, is we have to identify where those are, and we have to take advantage of the pipeline that's coming through, and we have to serve the kids better so they know, because they want it. I mean, they, the, if anybody thinks the system is broken, it's the kids who are in it, trust me. Um, but they, they have no way out. They have absolutely no way out. So if we could identify, you know, even the nursing program, but the one that does it in, you know, the integrative medicine model, you know, the, one, the places that are doing things in really interesting ways so that they're enhancing these deeper skill sets that are required, then I think you would, you would jumpstart it because the problem is you're not going to do it on the supply side. You're going to do it on the demand side, I think. It's the kids who are going to drive the change in this, not the institutions. The institutions have no motivation fundamentally to change. So my one example for this is Stanford. Um, I love this example. At Stanford Business School, there was a, a guy who, um, who wanted to uh, organize a program so that uh, Stanford business students could sit on nonprofit boards in the community. And the school's like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. So he was like, all right, well, screw you. I'll, I'll go do it on my own. So he set it up. He worked with some nonprofits in town. He got some other business students, and they started doing this. And before long, the next year, more of the students at Stanford wanted to participate in this program. And then suddenly Stanford was like, oh, okay, well, maybe we'll do it. And so then Stanford adopted it formally. And once Stanford adopted it, more students started going to Stanford because of that nonprofit partnership program. Now, Duke has a program like that, and a lot of other schools have programs like that, but it starts with, you know, it starts on the demand side, and then the institutions respond. That's why there's more economics courses and, you so know, business courses. I think so we're going to take up anyway. more of that in the workshop, and we are over time, so we're going to end this session. Thank you, guys.